Hi, this is Keith Coogan. You may remember he was Brad from Adventures of Babysitting. Kenny, don't tell mom, babysitter is dead. And my fantastic part in a Tales from a Crypt episode, House of Horrors, and you are watching Slasher Pepper. Enjoy. <laughs> hey guys, Slasher Pepper, and welcome to another video. Today, I'll be interviewing Keith Coogan, who's most well-known probably for his uh, role in Adventures in Babysitting. However, us horror fans, of course, know him from a much darker story called House of Horrors. How are you doing? I am fantastic. I It is an honor uh, to be on your show. This is international we're talking here. And uh, <laughs> uh, it was such a pleasure to be on um, Tales from the Crypt, the House of Horrors episode. Uh, so thanks for having me. I'd love to talk about it. Yes. Awesome. Well, um, first up, let's talk about the future. So um, do you have any new projects coming up? Yes, I have a thriller, yes, dark comedy, um, Wrong Reasons. Uh, and that will uh, is just finished all of its final filming and locked. It's like editing and stuff like that. So we'll start to hear more of that as it comes out. And that was shot during the height of lockdowns and pandemic screen actors guild um you know the union that represents actors uh in the united states they uh had come up with some guidelines and only really large productions could kind of adhere to the kind of tiered structure like uh you know you get temperature checked and stuff and you're in the parking lot you can right. get a covid test or two you can get into like zone two and then to get near camera or the actors or, you know, the actual set, they call that zone one. And that's like daily COVID testing, <clears throat> temperature checks, social distancing, masking, all that stuff. And you have to have a social distancing expert on the set. And just by not having that expert, you're violating SAG protocol. And uh, so it's an extra expense that, you know, kind of restructuring and movies and TV, uh, mainstream movies have been able to be quick to do that smaller medium-sized stuff it's been tougher they just kind of shut down um there's still some commercial production where they can but the micro budget stuff where we're talking an incredibly small crew we had a great uh director producer uh writer team in a uh, uh live and josh rouch and they um shot it with a crew of three to six people depending on how busy the day was and what needed to be done so there'd be an actor or two and then just three crew um, and so if you were very small in footprint, you could shoot during pandemic. And then I also did a uh, YouTube uh, series called The Quarantine Bunch. And that <laughs> is um, former child stars take to Zoom to uh, have their secret child star meetings. Right. So everyone's like the Brady Bunch, but in Zoom. So everyone's, just, you know, looking at each other that way. <laughs> it's funny when Zoom came out and had that layout typically i would see it like kind of three across or so but i realized there was a big layout immediately yeah. the brady bunch stuff started coming so yeah awesome and then uh continuing to audition and that's changed you no longer go into casting office or you know production office and audition you um film it at home hence the backdrop oh yeah and uh, i have a different camera i use for those with you know a little bit of the lensing and Right. Put on it so that I don't get lens flare when I use a little backlight. Yes, exactly. Um, lighting is, you know, incredibly important. And sound, do not in your filmmaking future. Yeah. <laughs> sound is really 50% of the picture. So always pay oh, attention yeah. to that. Just they say, um, elements. they say that, um, you know, audio is the most important of, of filmmaking in general, but probably. Just for visuals, it's uh, it's definitely lighting, I would say. Well, audio is the one that can make it, a, an audience can put up with poor uh, visuals. They can put up with black and white. They can put up with a little handheld. Yeah. They can put up with a slightly out of focus shot here and there. But if you have bad sound, their patience really goes away and they'll exactly. make it a few minutes to a movie. And, you know, so most of the time an independent film like Clerks, uh, gets picked up by a studio they'll spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on uh the sound mix on remixing the sound they did that for el mariachi 
which was a Robert Rodriguez's directorial debut, um, originally made for uh, Mexican uh, cable, Mexican television, and um, then was picked up across the border uh, by uh, Columbia Pictures, maybe. Um, they He recorded the sound out of sync, so he would just shoot the scenes without sound, and then afterwards take a little Radio Shack um, cassette, and then that mic, and have the actors record the dialogue and he would sync it up later by hand. So they said, well, okay, well, that's how you recorded it. Um, and they were kind of nervous about getting the sound you know, off of these cassettes. And the people at the studio, when they put the money into kind of bumping it up, they said, we'll have our best shot if you bring the original deck that you recorded it on, because those heads will match up right with the tape and it'll be the best sound that we can get. So uh, Robert Rodriguez said that, you know, he's sitting there in millions of dollars of equipment and space and thousands of dollars of rental a day. And there's huge, you know, multi-track studio <laughs> soundboard and next to it plugged in by a little eighth inch cable is a Radio Shack cassette player playing back these tapes. Um, so yeah, sound is really, really important. Um, and silent film is a great example. You don't need it to tell a story. So use it judiciously. Music's really expensive. Um, and dialogue should mean something. For sure. Just an opinion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would I would say so too. But yeah, like you said, then audio, like without audio, you're nowhere. But in terms of visuals, I would say lighting is the most important because you know, if there's like a bit too shaky no, uh, well, yeah, handheld yes. shot. At yeah, least you, you see something. To see, but composition, because in silhouette you can oh, still yeah. tell a story in composition and in shadow. Um, it so lighting is merely a tool for composition, right? And you could get more choices out of it the more tool you know lighting tools that you have. Less is more, and, and for lighting you want to. That's why sound stages are really used, even if it could have been shot in a regular house. It's difficult to control the light coming in the windows day and night and all that stuff. So being able right. to be in a sound stage where you start with nothing and the cinematographer can add just what he needs to tell the story. For sure. Yeah. And then um, now to go back to Tales from the Crypt, um, the yeah. episode House of Horrors. Uh, how did you get the role for Waters? It's traditional audition. Um you know, you go in real quick, read your lines. And I knew it was big ensemble cast with Kevin Dillon doing most of the heavy oh, lifting. Yeah. And I knew a lot of the cast members prior to going in, Meredith Salinger, uh, uh, um, you had uh, Courtney Gaines and uh, Deloise and uh, Will Wheaton um, and uh, uh, who were the uh, Jason... Um, thinking on names now um what a great cast uh oh yeah that was the funnest part is getting looking at the call sheet and going what who's on <laughs> this jason london everybody brought their um you know, like guitars and just hung out in the trailers and had fun um and uh, it was um you know they're they're quick episodes but it took a, a week to shoot and did we start yeah we started on the sound stages perhaps maybe um and shot all the stuff in the fake mansion and like the attic of the uh of the um girl sorority where they kind of turn into ghouls but the interior of the frat house was in a set that was used in critters <laughs> wow <laughs> that little house in critters maybe critters too um is next to the Nothing But Trouble house, which was the house they used in the House of Horrors episode on Tales from the Crypt. So the Dan Aykroyd, Demi Moore, um, John Candy picture, Nothing But Trouble. It has a big haunted mansion big yeah. on the uh, poster and everything. You look at any shot, production still of that film, and then match it up with the uh, House of Horrors episode. And it was shot just a few miles south of Magic Mountain off of the five, Interstate 5 in California, which is about 40 minutes north of... Um, like Hollywood. And uh, so we have a huge you know, amusement park and then there's just random land that they built this facade of a house. It's three-sided, so there's nothing on the back except for some right. stairs to kind of get up to each window and like open the window and look like you're in the house. Um, 
Yeah, that was, and that was really the two locations I, re yeah, remember them using for that. The studio was in uh, Venice Beach, Marina del Rey area. Awesome. And um, were you already and familiar we with Billy the show? Zane. He was shooting, Billy Zane was shooting his, you know how he was the vampire one? Yeah. Um, he was finishing up his episode as we were coming in. And so we got to meet him and stuff. That was really cool. And Bob Gale directed our episode, which, uh, you know, he uh, wrote uh, 1941. And um, oh, yeah. Is, uh, you know, he's, he's a <laughs> counterculture artist. And I love all of his work. Um, and so that was a neat kind of cult moment for me to be able to work with him. These things are done quickly. Uh, you look at the cast and um, there wasn't much need to really, and I want to say this in as gentle as a way I can, there wasn't any not much need to direct us because we all had lots of ideas and worked with each other instantly very well. So um, it was just all about kind of picking the shot up, shots up and we were we kind of free to do what we do as far as I remember. Awesome. I was worried about getting murdered on screen, you know, off yeah. screen, <laughs> uh, with the screaming because I could tend to throw my voice up when I scream. And um, and Will, did Will get murdered in that too? It was, I think it was one of the rare ones where we both got killed. <laughs> Python, Python, he died and I lived. He might, he might have lived in Tales from the Crypt and in uh, Toy Soldiers, he dies, I live. Uh, one of us, whenever Will Wheaton and I work together, uh, one of our characters has to die. In the movie. <laughs> wow yeah well <laughs> too bad yeah well you know happens yeah uh, i consider python and uh tales from the crypt to be amongst my kind of really only horror credits um yeah there is this bit part i have in soul keeper which is a great demonology kind of a movie fun comedic um but uh, my horror, uh, you know, I got it because I love doing conventions and I noticed the horror conventions are very popular, very oh, well yeah. attended. And the fans are very fetishistic. They will buy everything, um, <laughs> every doll, every you know, picture they can get. Um, and so I need to do more horror movies, definitely. <laughs> Since I already have a babysitting genre going, I need to do maybe a faster babysitter, kill, kill, yeah. third babysitter horror movie. That would be fun. <laughs> Murders in uh, babysitting instead of uh, adventures. <laughs> would you not see a movie called Poolside Babysitter Murders? Of course I would watch it. <laughs> but I'm watching it now in my head. <laughs> it's like it's made for me. <laughs> exactly. You know that Netflix uses its you may like algorithm to send messages to their... Um, developers of what people might like to see and that yeah. helps them green light productions um house of cards was one they noticed that people that like kevin spacey movies really liked the you know the foreign version of house of cards the original british version and uh the logarithm suggested to the executives if you made a u.s version of house of cards and it starred kevin spacey it would be a huge hit and it was so we don't know how many there it's now iterative and uh and um recursive that we're now going to see things that it thought that we liked or would like and then that's gonna um incite further choices so you know robots are going to be making movies soon yeah <laughs> right <laughs> they have ai at warner brothers to help they can plug in all the elements the script and the and the the cast and the behind the scenes the director and stuff and release date and what country and where and it'll tell them budget and how much it'll make before it ever wow. gets out of the script phase that's scary to me it is as would would harold and maude ever get made today would they ever make right exactly like they, they will probably take less risks you know <laughs> what's the log line for jaws three friends go fishing <laughs> doesn't sound like a winner to me yeah it's okay i, I think, I think um, uh, oh go ahead for the movie uh deadpool 
like in certain theaters they would just have stills from the from the romantic scenes and they would have this font that was just different and a different tagline um especially for valentine's day um so that guys could sneak in their girlfriends and be like oh it's a romantic movie don't worry and then once they were in the theaters their girlfriends would find out oh it's was it fight club right. that put um the first few minutes of a really cheesy inane comedy as their menu and then it glitches out was it that movie there was a movie that did that and it made you think you were watching the wrong movie Oh, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't think Deadpool did that. No, Are no, you... it wasn't Deadpool, but uh, I love that kind of stuff. Um, That's funny, yeah. though. <laughs> That's <laughs> creative. Like, uh, w- what kind of movie was it then? Maybe Fight Club or... <sighs> yeah. I want to say it was something like that, and it had... Um a fake dvd menu and everything and uh you know people are confused at first when they got it (laughs) that's awesome (laughs) (laughs) i had to go back to uh tales from the crib you guessed it um yeah when you when you did audition did you already like were you already familiar with the the series oh absolutely huge huge on uh uh, huge in the states and uh, we had uh friday the 13th um, the series we had a Freddy's Nightmares series. We and then the Tales from the Crypt. We had Tales from the Dark Side. Oh yeah. Um, which I always got Tales from the Crypt and Tales from the Dark Side kind of confused, just the title. Right. <laughs> uh, so when I was, you know, I realize I'm on the the Crypt Keeper one. That one's a little more fun and campy, campier. Um, oh yeah, it was that was great. I didn't realize that how um, how much staying power it would have over the years uh, it seems to be really popular uh tales from the crypt is uh usually mentioned by promoters that like autograph where they're like we'll put tales from the crypt on the sign um and fans are uh are into it and you know just this interview came about because of it so um yeah 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 no i was always worried about doing horror because i didn't want to kind of make myself unavailable for like family movies um, right and uh you know, hurt my brand. I didn't even know what brand it was. But now I'm all over it. I'd love to do horror movies. Awesome. Well, hopefully we'll see you in one soon then. <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, what, I wanted to, I want to know more about like, what was it like filming with Kevin Dillon? It was actually, it's actually a funny story for me personally, um, because I know Kevin Dillon as the long haired, badass dude in, in the Blob remake from the 80s. Um, yes. um, and that's got a great cast. Uh, yes. Smith, um, effects by Tony Gardner, right. who also did effects on Under the Boardwalk, a little surf movie I did. But then he also won an Oscar for, um, was it Dirty Grandpa or uh, one of the, where he did the age makeup for, uh, you know, one of those jackass type movies? Could be. Um, he and uh yeah he's now one of the top two or three makeup artists in town uh the blob was fantastic remake it knew exactly favorite killing the blob um you know which one i'm talking about kevin (laughs) the first one phone booth the phone Oh, that one is fucking amazing too best kill in the movie yes (laughs) well i mean for me It'll be the one with Kevin, like in the hospital where his arm gets ripped off, you know, um, because it just like shocked me, you know? Yeah. I don't get shocked I easily. Get pulled through walls and it just get melted, half melted off. Uh, I loved it when it melts the film. Oh, There's yeah. A lot of, you know, part of storytelling trope is a story within a story, a play within a play or a film within a film. And they do that uh, in Contagion when the virus spreads through the movie theater yeah. and they do it in the blob really well with the film you're actually watching broke because the blobs in the production. Yes. Booth. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely works. Uh, and um, everything from the opening, uh, you know, jump. And so I, you know, was very aware of Kevin um, 
as being uh, just fantastic, but you don't understand the gobs of dialogue he had to do. Speeches, speeches, pages, you turn it, it's just black text, all Kevin's speeches <laughs> for the Tales from the Crypt. Most of the other scenes with um, DeLuise and Courtney Gaines and stuff were all, uh, you know, short little, you know, zaps as they were yeah. all hazing the, the, the freshmen. So that was easy. Um, but Kevin um, had a, oh man, I don't know if I should tell this story. <laughs> I mean, it ups my respect for Kevin. He uh, had, uh, we show up one morning and we're at the House of Horror, the big house, the exterior location. And I think the call was maybe eight or nine or 10 a.m. because we'd shot late the night before. And we're kind of waiting around and we're waiting around and word gets around that Kevin had been um, arrested the night before. <laughs> and uh, so he had spent the night in jail and it, everything was fine and he was out and, um, you know, he wasn't in any trouble or anything like that, but it was, uh, you know, he <laughs> hadn't had the time to really go to your hotel or study your lines or, you know, be rested or anything like that. So we just felt awful. This cat comes in with no sleep and pulls off those pages of speak of the dialogue, the stuff that he says in front of the house before we go in. And he nails it over a take after take, word for word. He knew it prepared. I was, I've never been so impressed by an actor. Um, and in that moment, I was like, oh my God. And then when um, the uh, entourage came out, and he's killing it he's i mean he's killing it and it's so ironic that his character is the one that wins the acting award you know at the end of the series or in the movie or however they you know manage that storyline um that uh how great to actually be Maybe a not as box office because matt dylan you know really got kind of pushed with texts and uh um uh, you know, his earlier films. Um, and then he had, you know, instantly, you know, Flamingo Kid and the Big Big Eat, uh, bit and Big Time, Big Big Town, I think that was called. The one where he was like a gambler. Um, and uh, so huge respect for Matt, but then to think that Kevin Dillon is, is actually probably even a better actor than Matt Dillon. <laughs> And to see it go down in front of my eyes, you know, when he was kind of handicapped with, um, you know, not getting rest and stuff like that. So God bless Kevin and his talent and his preparation, just professionalism all around. Awesome. Uh, do you know why he was arrested in the end? It was all, uh, there was no reason. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's... It's something that would happen to his character in the blob, but to know that it also happened in real life. Do the producers do this on purpose? Do they fake arrest them? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, to get that call, I mean, we've had it. I was shooting a ski picture and um, Downhill Willie, and uh, we found out a driver had been busted crossing the border, uh, the US border with um, contraband goods. Nothing um, illegal per se, just maybe cigarettes that didn't have a tax stamp, you know, that right. kind of thing. And uh, that's always tough. And it's, you know, it's tough because, of, you know, a production can't take responsibility for every crew member, but it's also nice to see a production help that crew member out, maybe bail them out or, you know, that kind of a thing. So it happens There's when you're you know, talking about a crew of a hundred people, um, just statistics, it's bound to happen. We, you know, on toy so soldiers, there were bar fights that left a cast member with a broken nose it was covered up with makeup the next day um there i broke my nose on under the boardwalk cover that up with makeup um so it uh it's just funny yeah and it's, it's sometimes it's like leo dicaprio said when he was doing press for the uh the revenant he said the thing the scenes that you think are really hard to film might not be as hard to shoot as other scenes that you go oh it's just him walking from there to there um and uh so yeah, sometimes things that look really easy on film are not easy at all to do. Yeah. The difficult stuff, you know, there's so many tricks to filming that you can be oh, really yeah. safe and comfortable. It doesn't have to be ice cold water. 
poured on you in a movie uh you know you just act like it is so yes exactly yeah well everything seems easier until you do it <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah i know it does and um and, and you know the easiest reason to i mean the easiest way to learn is to do it as much as you can and make yes little movies or shorts or things or keep shooting um and uh it's tough to for me it's tough to have a story to tell that you know i'm not going to try to save the world but it's got to be important enough to make i guess it does. and i'm i tend to comedy too but as a filmmaker i have weird um favorites you know like clockwork orange and the sting and the exorcist and <laughs> yes you know i'm more of a raiders of the Lark, lost art guy above star wars and all that other stuff um, oh yeah jaws is probably my favorite movie there it is <laughs> uh so you know i'm an analog baby i was born in 1970 so those you know the godfather and and uh scarface and those kinds of films um were formidable presences uh, in my life growing up um and so i consider that the best kind or type or style of filmmaking now we have an all new one with superheroes and cgi that we couldn't there were things that were unfilmable in the past for technological reasons yeah. now we're finding there's th things that are unfilmable for story reasons or character reasons maybe there's a reason it was unfilmable um but visually and you know sound we can now create anything that you can imagine for sure yeah that actually brings me to my next question uh like i already mentioned jaws being your favorite movie um mm -hmm. like what are some of your other favorite uh horror movies especially oh uh gosh um it runs the gamut from the uh cunningham's uh friday the 13th to um uh you've got the thing you've got oh, yeah. uh um you know halloween um a carpenter is really great i think john carpenter is great at horror uh, because he's he's got his finger on the pulse of that um uh cosmic horror yeah um that dread cosmic dread cosmic horror um plus he's an incredibly skilled uh, filmmaker when he doesn't have a lot of money oh i love um prince of darkness by carpenter what a perfect b movie creepy something doesn't make sense but damn does it leave you unsettling so then move away from exorcist and psychological horrors and then you get into the 80s and the fly was a huge influence for me for body modification horror and that led to um saw and uh you know kind of an uptick in an appreciation for tom savini's style yeah i really saw that in in um hostel when uh jay is leaving um sneaking out on the uh, medical cart full of body parts the texture and color of the body parts reminded me of tom savini's work and he was able to get those close-ups that just really sold there was nothing that you know couldn't let you kind of imagine that that had happened to somebody and it really ups the terror and the fright and the dread level when you can oh, yeah. believe a kill for for christ's sakes so tom savini has been and oh i think the bet planet terror or grindhouse um a uh what do you want to call that an encapsulation of exploitation films and horror horror being thought of as an exploitation film until it won two best pictures uh exorcist uh silence of the lambs um did exorcist win best picture i think it did maybe it did um that it could be valued as a true dramatic genre for those kinds of awards is fantastic um but uh i don't like the jump scare stuff so um oh, Ringu yeah. and uh the grudge and um dark water 
I love Dark Water. Don't get me wrong. I think that's the one of the better of that style of um, that Japan horror that they were kind of mimicking for a while there in the 90s. So then we get to uh, the perfect storm in the 2000s with um, technology meeting, audience meeting, everything. The red camera comes along. And by the late 2000s, you have a cheaper camera that gives a professional result in low light that's perfect for horror. You can get a really pro look for little money. And then you can take some, you can make 10 of them and maybe one or two of them hits huge like The Witch or Bloomhouse. So Bloomhouse finally, you know, hit its stride with um, just knocking it out of the park and how they marketed and advertised. Uh, they rose to the cream of the crop because they realized they're not for everybody. Bloomhouse realized why do billboards, why do television commercials nationwide when maybe a 10th of the U.S. is even interested in seeing your genre. But if the 10th of the U.S. that really are interested in seeing this kind of a film, if they knew about it, oh, they'd see it. So they did targeted online advertising to people that only loved and purchased horror films and watched them in the theaters and went back and talked about it online. Do you find that demographic to market to? You narrow, bless you. You narrow down your <laughs> expense. You keep all of your budgets below $10 million And um, you have that formula, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And I was a part of kind of that revolution with Saban Films and Jay and Silent Bob Reboot, which I had a little cameo in. Kevin Smith had found a way to tour his films with uh, films like Red State and um, Yoga Hosers and uh tusk and uh you know out of the trunk of his car he was taken to the theaters have a ticket and a q a and screen it and then move to the next city and uh so we are uh so that that brings us to the present where you know horror films are on red box and cable and um you know really getting another mainstream whack um look at the work in hereditary um the dramatic work and uh, Lynn Shay, uh, Bob Shay's sister, she, uh, he was the one that, you know, helped bring Freddie and New Line Cinema. His sister Lynn Shay has, you know, series of hits, um, and uh, is really a, like a breakout superstar in that in that particular genre of horror. So it's uh, I love it. I still I have to be in the mood for it. Hit my peak with body horror at um masters of horror series and uh bk as uh imprint it's the scariest thing i've ever seen in my life i don't know if you've seen imprint i have not no i have oh, 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 not oh, even heard of it <laughs> <laughs> i'll have to see it then i used to make fun of people that go like this in horror movies I used to make fun of people that go, I can't, I, and speed search through something. I used to make fun of people that got squeamish or physically upset watching a movie. Um, there are times in imprint where I had to go like this. There are times in imprint I had to fast forward and get past something. And it brought incredible dread. Oh my God. It is, I don't know. It's like a dare. If you could tie off against imprint and face the screen and watch it the entire time that's um incredible inner strength <laughs> you have to see it immediately it is the the most horrifying thing i've ever seen oh god definitely check it out then <laughs> and i tried watching some of the other things in that series it was a series of 10 films made by horror masters and one of them maybe there was a deer deer daughter or something it's about a woman that turns into a killer deer it was fantastic but the others were shaky or weak or i couldn't get into them imprint somebody recommended it to me i watched it absolutely horrified you must watch it next chance that you get oh i will definitely <laughs> <laughs> it's still traumatizing you yeah i can't even can't even imagine it 
horrifying. The author shock. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's really and, good. Really good. Um, then I have a, a bit of a philosophical question, I guess. Um, oh, I love that. If you ruled the world, what would the world look like? Oh, wow. Um, did you ever read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? No, no, I've heard of it, of course, but I haven't read it's, it. Um, a series of five books in a trilogy by Douglas Adams. Right. Uh, an increasingly misnamed trilogy. <laughs> and um, in one of them, they find God. And God is in a shack on a beach. He's a hermit. And in when he's in his shack, he's outside. And when he leaves his shack and comes to the beach, he, he's inside. <laughs> so I would probably be more like that hermit God, because I, I was raised Catholic and in Genesis, there's a, you know, thing of how we base the Sabbath and the day of rest off of creation and the light and firmament and the thing and the thing and the thing and then God rested. And um, depending on which book you read, some are like, oh, his son kind of pops up in another story. But um, that uh, first book, you know, creator God um, manifests itself in interesting ways to people. Um, and then rested. And a lot of philosophers have thought that we are neglected children because of the horrors you see in the world the inequality the unfairness the class struggles the poverty the uh, disease the death the the torture the just human existence is filled with such nightmares and i think that's why you know horror is a great genre to deal with that they say that watching a horror film and living through it helps your psyche because now you've confronted something your fight or flight instinctives kicked in and you lived through it and your body relaxes and those you know adrenaline and cortisone levels start to come down again but they remain elevated for a long time and that's how the um the jump the fake jump scare which is typically a cat as in alien and then a real scare is the ultimate manipulation audience because you've got tensions levels rising and then you scare them with a cat and as soon as people go oh it's a cat their conscious fear goes down. They go, oh, okay, we're cool, we're a cat. Meanwhile, that scary music's still going on and we're still on the handheld shot down the you know, scary locker room. Yeah. <laughs> and so then when the thing shows up, really they've been going up here the whole time and they think they're no longer scared after the fake jump scare. So it's, it's done really well. And one of the best ones is the mirror shot. God, it gets me every time. And I love it when filmmakers learn how to do it different. So it, the typical shot is you're facing a mirror in a bathroom and you have a character come up to it and you see the character and themselves in the mirror. Yep. <laughs> and they open it. And now you're just looking at the back of the character and what the pills they're about to take. Yep. When they close that fucking medicine cabinet, <laughs> the thing is standing behind them. So I've seen them de- uh, subvert that and I forget what it was, but they did it. They closed it and nothing was there. And you went, phew, and they turned around and it was standing right behind you. Yeah. Might have been Crimson um, Peak, but it was done. It was done just to mess with me. And um, I like that because then it threw threw me off, you know, of when the expectation of when to get scared. (laughs) Man. Yeah, they're getting good with that. I hate that. I hate that. I hate that. It's always with a string stab. And like, oh, God. (laughs) For sure. One of the best uh, scares, jump scares, though, and I think it can be earned if it's at the stinger of a of a zombie movie like. What's the one where they finally wind up on an island that's supposed to be safe? It was either militaristic. It wasn't the mall one. It might have been militaristic. And they get finally at the end, they get to an island and they're like, cool, we're safe. And all of a sudden, Rah! end of movie and you're just like ah god damn it you got me i love that or friday zombies no zombie movies was my favorite genre for years i wrote a zombie movie i wrote a zombie treatment um 
and then it got overplayed. Oh, well, Friday the 13th is also a good example at the end when Jason jumps out of the lake, you know? That was a reshoot shot here in LA that was not shot up in, um, yeah, and that was Savini <laughs> all the yep. way. Um, and what a, uh, you know, and that also, it comes off of Carrie having that hand come up through the grave at the end of the original yeah. Carrie was the jump scare that everyone, you know, was looking for that. So when Betsy, oh man, that is a good one. No, all of those, then you're expecting him and then you're not. And yeah, it's good. No, the horror genre, it was fun when it's like a roller coaster and when it becomes something like Freddy and uh, the uneven Friday the 13th series, um, you the format itself and the history of the films itself are very much of a part of whatever current movie you're watching. They have to be because they're telling, trying to tell the same story over and over again, but keep it fresh. Yeah. Oh, and I love the final destination films. There's oh, another yeah. one, psychological horror, fate, predetermination. Yep. Um, that could also be called cosmic horror in a way The time itself and yeah. death itself. Is, yeah. is it known? Is it written in the book? I mean, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, fantastic. It's a great, because, you know, not everybody does appreciate the horror genre. I do want to get into more horror films, but I don't necessarily want to get killed or have to scream <laughs> or anything like that. That would be nice. <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, play the killer. Um, you know, uh, oh, there's also, there's really good, like, biopics of um known serial killers kind of like true crime stuff oh yeah rooker in um henry, what do you do the, what's that henry yeah that's probably i mean not only is it michael rooker's it's fantastic work by rooker but that is a compelling um film and uh there's a lot of the Dahmer one my friend Dahmer and um they're, uh, they're interesting. I mean, I've read Helter Skelter twice. I've read um, Buried Dreams twice, at least, the John Wayne Gacy book. Uh, I'm up on my serial killers. <laughs> um, and I got to work with Billy Peterson, who was in Manhunter, um, and uh, gave me some insight into Michael Mann and that, you know, when you're a method actor, kind of like William Peterson, and then you're shooting Manhunter, with a very challenging technical director. And then you have, in Adventures of Babysitting, we had a handsome John Pruitt, our tow truck driver with the hook. His brother is um, the killer in Manhunter. <laughs> Noonan, Tom Noonan is yeah. John Ford Noonan's <laughs> brother. And he is so sweet and wonder, and he can be so scary. <laughs> oh my God. So yeah, there's, I love all, I do, I do, I do, I do, but you have to be in the mood for it. I remember I got into a car accident. Um, I was a passenger, just the violence of it and the PTSD. I wasn't really injured. It was nothing major. Okay. Good. Um, but for a while, it was hard to watch anything with gunfights, car chases, crap murders, you know, it just, I didn't want anything violent really for a while. And then I think paranormal activity was released and I went, it's paranormal. I mean, it can't be that bad. Oh, and I also worked with Neil Fredericks, who was the cinematographer on Blair Witch Project. <laughs> right. <laughs> he um, set up the camera, loaded it, uh, taught them how to work it, and would set it, the lighting and stuff, and then hand it to him. And, he, and that's he, creating an aesthetic, which is the job of a cinematographer. He wasn't the operator. The cast member was the operator, but it was interesting. Um, uh, and also the first, real because Paranormal Activity we knew wasn't real, but Blair Witch got everybody. Blair Witch, the whole the myth and legend of it, um, the fake interviews they did with townspeople, the press releases, the cast disappearing and not updating their IMDb profiles, like they've dropped off the face of the earth. Heather was genius at that. Um, and that trailer, uh, the poster, it just worked. It worked on yeah. every single level. And when something like that happens, a paranormal activity or a um, uh, even Faces of Death. I grew up with Faces of Death, and that turned into a phenomenon. And the you know copyright issues where it was remade by different filmmakers and different versions. And 
half of it's faked and a lot of it is other footage that's you know terrible accidents but they're not what there is no such thing as a snuff film did you ever see snuff on uh netflix i don't no i don't think i did it's a documentary on whether snuff films are real right brilliant they're like they're a legend they're a myth they talk to fbi they talk to you know police in towns that have chased them and all that and and tried to find them they look at eight millimeter and the um, black dahlia uh cases uh because you know they think maybe she she took part in some stag films and stuff that might have been shot at locations and stuff and they're like they have never ever been they even put the guy on trial for was it um cannibal holocaust um, oh yeah they put an italian filmmaker on trial because of a poll scene where a woman is pulled and skewered and she's at and the pole's coming out of her mouth and she's like I, I, I scream. and they're like you killed somebody and so he had to bring into court the bicycle seat on the end of a pole for the actor to sit on and the prop which sits in your mouth and then looks like it's coming out and he demonstrated how the effect was done in court and the judge looked around and was like oh so nobody was okay then and and um acquitted him of all charges but i think it was just so funny that he pulled off such a good effect that he was brought to court that yeah. was really believed to be a snuff film and it it was not that's the closest they think they've ever come because it actually was brought into court but they just don't they just don't know if they exist <laughs> it's so cool though like how far they can go <laughs> with with effects well that's horror that's yeah. ultimate horror loss of control torture death you know, filming the exploitation of human soul like that is, you know, personally, probably one of the most horrific things you could possibly imagine. Yes. And I think that's why it's one of those things, man, that just, it's fascinating. I know reading all those serial killer books didn't help me. Albert <laughs> Fish. And, oh God. Terrible. <laughs> well, lots of controversy with horror most of the time. Lots of what? Controversy often with horror movies. <laughs> Oh, with horror movies, yes, when they get blamed on a societal ill. Oh, yeah. Um, but, um, you know, psychologists have, you know, looked at the cathartic effect that horror films have. And the reason why they became a subgenre of uh, teenagers uh, approaching and learning of their mortality and having that moment to kind of face mortality and, um, you know uh come out of that after an hour and a half and then go get um a hot dog and you know go to the soda fountain maybe get some pizza um you know i was a teenage werewolf and the original blob um you know the blob was anti-communism that was a red scare film um a lot of films a lot of you know xenophobia films alien stuff was um xenophobia stuff um Rod Sterling knew the power of using science fiction to get around uh, sensors, television sensors, just to, to tell stories. So did Gene Roddenberry. Science fiction is a great tool to um, approach a social issue and look at it pragmatically, um, or at least just from a third, you know, another perspective. Um, but horror could, has that power to do that. Absolutely. You don't think there's a political point in Hostel or in um, Breakdown? Or, I mean, there are some of the Kurt Russell breakdown is great. That's more thriller. But um, the, it is uh, it's very scary. I, you know, people stumble across a dead body in the forest. It must be horrifying. People find family members, grandpa, grandma, they went in the night and you go to wake them up and, oh God, they're cold and stiff. How horrifying. Yeah. Um, you know, I got, I saw my grandfather uh, on his deathbed in the hospital. He'd already passed. So when I came in, I looked at him. This guy had such bad sleep apnea. We used to shake him to make sure he was breathing just when he was sleeping because he looked dead. So I looked at him on his hospital bed and he looked more alive than we used to check on him when he was dead. I was like, he looks, what do you mean? Really? He's dead? So there was no horror there. It was all, you know, just dealing with it. He was really gone. Um, Yes, his skin was a little cold, but I got there within an hour of death, so it wasn't that bad. I saw somebody die in a car accident, um, maybe eight or eight years old. A Jeep flipped over, and his head 
got caught in the roll cage and oh god it was awful wow it was a smear on the thing i'm like oh but that's in real life not everybody in the family finds the body not everybody gets into an accident not everybody finds the pet that died um i was always out of town when my mom took a dog and or you know even our grandma would do that we'd leave town and if the dog was older or sick she'd go put it down at the vet we get back to yeah i took care of the dog what we didn't even get to say goodbye so i was removed from that mind that horror um so the psychologists know that dealing with that is uh, very helpful so that you don't just lose your mind at the sheer madness of the universe and our existence as humans on this planet today right now um i'd say that there may be a, you know a lot more psychological horrors or horrors that we are a fearful for than the primal basic ones of food clothing shelter are we warm enough or cold enough have we eaten enough and did we get enough sleep and you know procreating it's really all humans have to worry about yeah later as we develop the societies to where are we going to eat maybe we should buy a new bed ours is kind of getting lumpy and i only got six hours of sleep because the new video game came out last night <laughs> much different problems that we face as humans than we did just five thousand years ago so um the brain adapts the brain grows um we know that this genetic memory passes on through generation to generation they did this looking at worms and they exposed them to sunlight and they like triggered their some reaction when they were exposed to sunlight and then they kept dividing the worms and until there was none left of the original worm generation and they, they still exhibit the behavior then they ground up the worms and they fed them in a matrix to new worms that had never been connected genetically to the original worms. And those worms exhibited the reaction to light behavior that is not natural in the worms that the original generation that had now been cut off. It was kind of the monkey problem. You have, you know, room full of 10 monkeys and you, and you, you, uh, you flash a light and then water just pours into the thingy. So every time you flash a light, monkeys go for hide for cover because the water is going to pour on them so they get trained and then you remove a monkey and you put a new monkey in and you remove you keep doing that and by the end you have 10 monkeys that were never there for the initial conditioning but as soon as the light goes on they go run for cover you don't even need the rain anymore yeah um so so that there is something that we're learning about being human and how to deal with existing on a spinning rock in the universe where we don't know if we're the only ones or not the ramifications of either are are hard to deal with if we are alone that's a huge responsibility and how horrifying if we're not alone oh my god what's out there how horrifying yes um so uh yeah that's a pretty deep conversation but For sure see, that's the thing is that that's why horror i think is underappreciated it's not as big as superhero movies or romantic comedies yeah um but uh it's got a very rabid fan base that are passionate that understand it and enjoy it <laughs> and um i need to do more of it so i make more money at autograph shows <laughs> <laughs> it has to be union so any producers out there making a horror movie and you room for a babysitter movie keith coogan guy um i would so do it awesome well, i gotta read the script and run it by my agent but i'm so in yeah <laughs> As long as you don't die. Nah, depends on how much they pay me. Right. <laughs> uh, and then my last question, which is, uh, what is some advice you would like to give to uh, younger actors? Well, um, I'm sorry. And uh, you have to do it if it's the only thing you can do, meaning that you would die if you couldn't do it um there are a lot of other career options that are easier uh it is a hard way to make an easy living yes you're not digging a ditch and you're not getting food all over yourself and you're not serving people but you are and you gotta know how to take direction the best actors in the world that have all won oscars and stuff uh, they didn't do it alone on the set 
they even they had to be humbled and take direction. No, no, Mr. De Niro, try it this way. Boom, Oscar. Um, it's collaborative medium. Careers are cyclical. Talents and experience are linear. So you can grow your talent and experience, but your career can go up and down and around. So don't focus on that. Don't focus on the career. Do the work. Um, I uh, heard this about screenwriting that um, that uh, a script that's okay, eh, maybe has an actor attached to it, can make the rounds in Hollywood and will get uh, you know eh, maybe not you know, immediately picked up or whatever. But you know it's represented by good people and a writer that's out of the credits. But a script with no representation or literary agent somehow it's really good and it gets around in town it'll get bought and it'll get made so quality really is the you know the biggest thing um it, it will you know that it will eventually get produced so don't let the gatekeepers dishearten you there are um currently there's no middle ground but there is Hollywood production, and then there's completely independent production. Um, currently, the only way to kind of get name actors or face actors into these independent productions is to work with the Screen Actors Guild. But then there's budget level concerns and insurances and rules and things that makes it very difficult in legal issues. So they're separate for now. Um, but there's a middle ground of people that are producing higher quality content and creating talent that aren't part of this union so um got a way to find a way to make it really inclusive open the door for the content generators um and filmmakers to uh to have a place at the table find the best of the material that we can um and you know hollywood mainstream and big budget looks at horror as a uh, trend or a fad and they're not going to stick uh multi multi-million of dollars into a bunch of horror movies every life they're going to be kind of judicious and they're mostly going to have action and adventure and superhero romantic comedy in this yep. and then one big horror movie that they'll spend kind of too much on and it better be really good that's not how you get good at it you get good at a big big bloom house and making 10 of them a year so you know i don't always follow this advice because um because of reasons um I am perfectionist, so it's hard to get going because, oh, it's not going to be perfect, so why start? Uh, but also, done a lot of work and have a um, fun schedule. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and also, I'm very, very adherent to union, obviously. So I can't even really create my own stuff until I kind of make that outlay of costs to turn union at the insurances and all that other stuff. So it's kind of left me, me in this limbo where I want to create more than I am. Um, so uh, don't be, don't feel too frustrated with that. I guess, you know, you know, everybody's got a phone, so you can certainly shoot a, a video storyboard of your idea, and um, and and there you go. And then you do it again, and then you do it with lights, and then you do it again, and then you do it with better sound. And you've seen a lot of filmmakers go from a short version to a feature version to a remake and a big studio version. Um, Aronofsky is a great example of making a film and then let's maybe put some more money into it and make it again or making a short. I know that uh, following and Memento, you know, be modest. Uh, best thing I read about film, oh, this is great. Okay, I got it. Do you want to hear great advice, the best advice for if you're going to make your own short film? Absolutely. <laughs> Don't touch the fish. Sushi chefs, master sushi chefs. It takes 10 years or so to become a sushi chef master. And that, you, even then you're kind of junior level. For the first four years, maybe you cook rice. You will never touch the fish. At the fifth year, you start to learn some prep things to help the main sushi chef. But you're, you're really barely touching the fish. So when you start out, don't touch the fish. 
don't take this huge finale thing confrontation. Don't take something that's technically hard to do. Don't take something that takes a lot of uh, exposition. Don't touch the fish. If you're starting out and you're early, work on the rice, work on the basics, framing, exposure, sound. Um, just did it expose, was it in focus? Can I put those together, create the, what is it, Kleinhoff effect, where you edit the juxtaposition of images after each other creates a, um, a connotation and a context. Someone just thinking right there of a shot of them in a window, and then you cut to a close up of a rose. Maybe they're thinking about a flower, and then you cut to a dog. I, I, I don't know. Your mind starts to build a narrative just by yeah. putting images together. I, I did some programming, so I like to say I love Kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. Don't <laughs> overcomplicate things. And I think Don't Touch the Fish is a great way. You don't even touch the fish for to four years while you're learning that. That's a highly advanced part of doing that. Um, so I would also recommend if you're going to be a director, do every other job on the crew that you can so that you understand the lingo, the jargon, the technical limitations. Yeah. And where you can push those limitations. Because if you don't know, you don't know. Um, there's too much. Uh, who said it? Was it John Lennon? He said, uh, oh, no, it was um, Scorsese. He said, to be a director, you have to be good at and learn and study uh, fine art, ballet, movement, mime, song, dance, theater, drama, dramatic structure, acting, filmmaking, camera movements, editing techniques, sound techniques. Those all come together. And each one has an expert. You have a great sound designer. You have a great cinematographer, a great lighting designer, um, an amazing costumer. No one person can take care of that. So it's collaborative. Keep it simple. And don't touch the fish. Simple scene. Yes. One scene. What are you going to do for college? I don't know, man. What are you going to do? Party! That's it. Cut, print. Make a... Uh, a um, a uh, digital uh, media package for you know TCP. Go play it in a theater. Sit in a theater and watch what you just shot. One minute long, inane dialogue. Nothing, nothing happened. It was two shots, that I, two singles, maybe in a master that I cut back and forth. How good's the sound? How good's the lighting? How good were the performances? Even if it was nothing. Even if you're just cooking rice. So don't touch the fish. And then you'll really start to build the building blocks that you need to build the house. Um, that's my advice. Man, that's good advice. Yeah, I think um, in 30 years, I'll still be thinking of don't touch the fish now. <laughs> mm. I think you can look up that phrase, like filmmaking and don't touch the fish. Um, and uh, you can find the kind of article or reference, you know. Um, right. And it was, and I had the same kind of reaction to it I, that I think that I'm getting from you. You went, yeah. oh, because you can be really ambitious. Film is a very powerful medium. And you yeah. go, oh, if I could do that. You know, it's just a tracking shot running backwards. And then you got a couple of squibs going off. Do you understand the number of people and departments and coordination and pre production and planning and safety meetings and legal regulations and permits to be able to do that? in control and safely and be able to repeat it um so uh, learn your workflow shoot something spit it out put it up get feedback rinse and repeat i guess yeah and start small i as an actor i did i did commercials to guest appearances on tv to movies of the week after school specials and the features tv series um and so as a filmmaker that's a great way look a lot of huge directors like tony scott rest in peace um ridley uh fincher uh they all got started shooting commercials <laughs> car commercials so another exercise to do as a filmmaker is shoot a commercial shoot a commercial for coffee shoot a commercial for coca-cola shoot a commercial for your honda civic <laughs> i'm serious yeah Watch a commercial, which, by the way, a 30-second commercial has about 48 cuts in it. So you're looking at 0.6 seconds per shot. Got to think about that while you're shooting it. 
Got to think about your end market. Can you, can you mimic a car commercial? Do it. Great exercise. Then you got this piece of footage and they're like, wow, I love that ramp, speed ramping. I love that. So yeah, oh, he really inspired me today. Thank you, Rogier. Uh, what was, how did, what was your other, your, um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. And I hate to do this on here. How do you say your name? My full Dutch name is uh, Rogier Dijkgraaf. Look here. Uh, yeah, so thank you. You reminded me and inflamed my my passions for filmmaking from the interview. Awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> That's great. Awesome. <laughs> and then... Oh, yeah. Spider-Man. Classic. OG Spider-Man. For sure. Yeah, is there uh, anything you would like to add to the interview? No, thank you. Um, I got to talk the deepest stuff I knew about the horror genre. Yes, that is awesome. Uh, I got to turn you on to Imprint. Did you ever see yep. um, Audition? Also, I did not see that yet. Oh, Imprint and Audition. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know if you... Yeah, you might want to build up. So Audition is great. Um, a uh, businessman has trouble finding um, a girl... So his friend recommends holding fake auditions for a Hollywood project to find his new girl. <laughs> it doesn't go well. Oh man, I can't. It's horrifying. Audition, and that's by the same director of Imprint. Uh, what is it? I don't know how to say his name. Takashi Miike. Oh, it's kind of like Rogier Dijkhoff, isn't it? <laughs> About like what? It's kind of like Rogier Dijkhoff, isn't it? It is. It is. Well, the trick is for him, it's, I think the Takashi part is he, but the Mike is spelled M-I-I-K-E. So I don't know if it's Mike or Meek or Mike. I, yeah. So that's where I don't. And not enough people pronounce his name because he's a in the corners director of, of the horror genre. Meaning, right. I mean, so many other directors are inspired by him. Oh, and then you have... Um, uh, who's the one that did Crimson Peak and Hellboy and uh, uh, the Spanish director? Oh, Guillermo del Toro. Yes, yes, yes. That's that's it. Talk about the visual part of doing it. Um, it he's, you know, he's a he's he's a master at bringing that that visual part and getting in your head too. Definitely. Yeah. And I think some a lot of what he does is considered could be considered horror. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I would say so too. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much for your time on this interview. And I'll definitely uh, remember, don't touch the fish. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And, you know, one day you'll start touching the fish. You'll be like, all right, I got this. And you're not going to poison anybody. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thanks, man. It was a great interview. I appreciate the time. Thanks for having me on. You're and, so welcome. Uh, thank, thank you to everyone for watching and listening. Yeah, thanks everyone for watching, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. See ya. See ya. All right, all right. Oh, it just have to be today, the light. You again, you again. I know you're coming later.